just pay your pay. Uh, what else have I got here? I've got... Uh, don't have book three. You son of a bitch. <laughs> I keep a mental tally. Every time somebody brings up book three, I'm like, ah, that's another vacation day for me. <laughs> um, let me see. You know, let's do story time. I mean, when's the last time you got a story read to you, like a picture book read to you? Right? So can we bring the house lights way down? Yeah, or the screen. Also, these right here. Yeah. Let's bring these way down. Way down. And these. It's really, honestly, the dimmer it is, the better I look. Who's heard or read The Adventures of the Princess and the Sword? Okay, so we got a good mix here. Um, this is a little side project that I wrote long before I was ever published. And uh, I teamed up with my friend Nate Taylor to do the illustrations. If you've read Slow Regard, he also illustrated Slow Regard. We do a bunch of stuff together just because I love his work. Okay, I'm gonna stand real close to the edge of the stage so that when the shift, uh, the ship shifts, I'll fall off, and that'd be great. <laughs> no, no, wait for it. Okay. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a princess who lived in the Marzipan Castle. She lived there all alone. Is this a little blurry or where am I drunk? It could be both, I will admit it might be both. Um, just close one eye. Or if you're drunk, maybe it's in focus. I don't want to judge. Except for Mr. Whiffle, who didn't count because he was only a teddy bear. And the thing under the bed. Mr. Ripple was the princess's best friend. They spent all their time together and had many fabulous adventures. They found buried treasure by the old sump. They defeated the Black Duke's rebellion at the Battle of Bainbridge. Victory came at a great price. The princess was sore wounded, and Sir Whiffle was forced to take terrible revenge. <laughs> they fought Greenbeard the pirate, and defeated him. <laughs> Though in the heat of battle, Mr. Whiffle was nearly drowned, and was only saved due to the princess's quick thinking. But when her daytime adventures were over, the princess always returned to her marzipan castle. After she had dinner and washed her face, she and Mr. Whipple went to bed. But they were not alone. The princess had never seen the thing under the bed because it didn't like the lights. During the daytime, when the bright sun was out, it hid in the deep shadows under the bed. It even hid at night when the lamps were lit. That's why the princess always kept a candle burning. But some nights, when it was stormy out, there were drafts in her room. Then the thing didn't need to hide anymore. The princess had never seen the thing, but she knew what it was like. It had great wide eyes that could see in the dark, and a great wide mouth for tasting things. 
It had thin, flat lips and a wide, flat tongue. Its skin was greenish, greenish, brownish, and the princess thought that it was prickly like a metal, or scaly like a fish, or slimy like a frog, but it was actually soft like velvet, so the thing never made any noise at all when it moved. The princess knew that it had great big hands with great long fingers. And its long, long arms had an extra elbow so it could reach out from under the bed, reach up, then bend to reach the top of the bed. And to call the princess. <laughs> Because now, of course, any other kids here? I'm serious. Do we have any kids here? How young are our kids? This is uh, this is on you. Right like, uh, I, I hear like this is a great story. Uh, we're done. We're done. But there's more. And uh, I read this. To, you guys know Brian Brushwood. I went to his house, we're hanging out, having a good time. It turns out his daughter has read my books, like The Name of the Wind. And she's like 10, 11, she went out and got a cloak and wanted pockets in it. So like, she came home and she's like, oh, you wrote these books and we're having a moment. I'm like, this is so neat. And I'm like, you know, I got a book that you might not know about. And it went badly, right? <laughs> say it went badly because this is not a kid's book. This is not a kid's book. I'm serious, this is not a kid's book. Okay? All on you. Have you signed something about therapy? <laughs> One day a package arrived for the princess in this sweet little innocuous book that is the yeah, kid's book. Don't worry about it. <laughs> the princess loved the kitten. She and Mr. Riffle spent a long time trying to decide what his name should be. The princess wanted to call him Mr. Mutton Chop because of how he smelled. <laughs> Mr. Riffle wanted to call him Marlock because of his pointy, pointy claws. <laughs> they compromised by calling him M.M. or M for short. But then Annie got lost. She wasn't in their treasure mine, or in the old cave. Mr. Whipple suggested they look in the river, but Annie wasn't there either. <laughs> they knew he couldn't get over the wall, or past the gate. They looked everywhere. But they still hadn't found any by dinner time. Oh. That night, the princess couldn't sleep. Thinking about the lost kitten made her tummy hurt. Even worse, her candle was short. And the night was long. And her tummy hurt. Then the princess heard a noise from under the bed. She knew it couldn't be the thing because it never made any noise except for sometimes a soft, velvety rustle. The noise sounded familiar to the princess. It was like the sound an animal would make if it wanted to cry out, but it was muffled and quiet. Then the noise stopped. And the princess heard a soft, velvety sound, like something was reaching and bending, reaching and bending. Then something wet and warm fell onto her face. Drip, drip, drip. Then 
then Mother Moon came out from behind a cloud, and the princess saw what the thing was holding. the thing had been eating it. He wanted to share and be friends. He was already friends with Emmy. They had been playing under the bed all day. Emmy had been trying to call to the princess, but he couldn't. He'd been eating marzipan with the thing, and his little kitten mouth was all gummed up. When he tried to mew, it came out But now they were together again. And now that the princess had met the thing, she wasn't scared anymore. And so the princess ate them. And there was nothing left but sticky bones. <laughs> so she and Mr. Wilco made a fort out of them. <laughs> and had tea. As the people that have heard the story before get to experience it through the eyes of the people who haven't seen it yet. But then there's some people in the audience that comes to the end of it and people are kind of like, you know? And I know what that is. That is the dissatisfaction that comes from a cheap twist ending, right? But I would hope those of you that have read my work I think the rest of you, you don't know me from a hole in the wall, but if you've read my work, I would hope that you would realize that I would never resort to bullshittery like a twist ending. Because this is not a twist ending. This is a story that you have probably been doing a shit job of understanding. <laughs> and that is not my fault. So let's help you out here. Once upon a time, there was a princess who lived in a marzipan castle. She lived there all alone. <laughs> mm hmm and the bad teddy bear, oh, adventures. Oh, great children. Yeah. And it's a little tricky to see here, but if you're paying attention, you can still see um, the heads on pikes in the background. <laughs> it's just, you know, I mean, I've already, I told you, Mr. Whiffle had to take care of a little wrench, but I figured I'd show you too. Um, yeah, and you know, it, it is fair. If you read it the wrong way, if you weren't really paying attention, it does have a lot of the characteristics of a children's book. It does have pictures, you have a teddy bear in it, you have this repetition, you know, some of these descriptions are very children's booky. But, you know, back when they used to still invite me to speak at high schools, <laughs> um, yeah, like look at this. Dude is legging it away. <laughs> um, I want to call him Mr. Munchop because of how he smelled. <laughs> um, at some point in this book, you go from 
maybe making some reasonable mistakes to being like willfully non-complicit in the story that is actually occurring. <laughs> because, you know, like here, like all the suits of armor, yeah, when there's a hole punched in the chest, there's a bite taken out of the shield over there. Treasure <laughs> mine. And when I, when I spoke at high schools, um, you can hear, even in a room of you know, 200 people, that somebody whispers in the back. And I remember one kid leaned over to another and said, there's a lot of bones in this book. <laughs> I'm like, good. Good for you. I want you to run in the country when you grow up. <laughs> one person in this room of 200 kids can tell a hawk from a handsaw. Um, now here, you just gotta, you know, you don't put somebody in a gibbet and then expect it to be, and this isn't a keeping things out wall. So, she hadn't found any by dinner time. Okay, are, are we on the same page now? Do I need a cliff note this? So, I never thought of this as a kid's book, but it turns out a lot of kids love it. A lot of kids love it, because kids are a lot darker than we give them credit for. And so I forgot that I never thought of this as a kid's book, and I read it to Brian Rushwood's daughter. It was like 10, I figured she read my book, whatever. We got to the reveal, and I kind of like, ta-da! And she It was, and I still, it's been a year now, and I feel bad, like I need to send her a fruit basket or something. <laughs> um, yeah, so, oh, there you go. Adventures of Princess and Mr. Whipple. Um, yeah, it's a good time. You guys have a good time. Thank you. So, what do we got here? 